I've been here for um, a really long time, um, something in the range of 32, 33 years. I stopped counting at 30. Um, so I've seen a lot of changes here and not all of the changes I'm going to show you though. Some of them really predate me. But I thought we would take a quick look today at the building and the changes that have happened to the building. So this isn't by any means a comprehensive look at the historical society. It's just some really fun pictures and um, some, some just fun, cha fun changes to the building. It doesn't include the Tapping Reef House, which I could do on another day if you want me to. It doesn't include the people who made this organization, the great organization that it is. And it doesn't include the work we do or why we do it. But all of that will be included in our new exhibit that we will put up as soon as we are able to reopen to the public, which is called um, From Antiquarian to Accredited. And it's a history of the organization. So this is just a little preview of that. So here we go, except it's not working. I have to be there. There we go. Okay. I'm learning the technology as we go here, folks, so bear with me. So these two pictures show um, early images of the building. The one in the, um, on my screen anyway, in the top left-hand corner calls it the Noyes Memorial Library. And the building was built in about 1900 to house the town library. And um, you can see that if you compare that picture to the one in the bottom right-hand corner, you can see the building is a little bit smaller. The, the um, rear addition is not there yet. And the rear addition was put on in 1906. And that was really um, put there to house the historical society. So I'll be showing you some pictures of the library when it was the early, early library and some pictures of the historical society from this time period. And one of my favorite things in um, the picture on the bottom right is you can see in the front, the mile marker that was on the corner of um, South Street and East Street. And the mile marker um, is still there, but sadly all of the words on it have been erased um, over time. So um, it just is a little bit of what, what used to be what used to be with us. So um, so take a look at the the back end of the building where you can see the arched window, which is the um, the stained glass window that's in um, the gallery upstairs. So this is that gallery in the early days of the Historical Society. So the stained glass window, the, the guy with the wings there is a memorial to Revolutionary War soldiers that was um, put in by the DAR soon after the building opened. Um, this is one of my favorite pictures of all time because as you look closely at it, you can pick out all sorts of um, favorites from the collection. So a, up here, I don't know if you can see my cursor, but right there is Philo Ruggles, who is one of our Ralph Earl portraits. Um, there's some female academy things down here. Um, this tape, there's a, a tilt top table next to the fireplace, and that was made from the wood of Lyman Beecher's pulpit. So this is really the sort of antiquarian historical society that a lot of um, organizations started out with in the early 1900s. So um, the the room you can see has um, galleries along the top balconies and there are some of the other Earl paintings are leaning up in the galleries, in the gallery. So it's kind of a hodgepodge, but it's a wonderful view of our collection as it, as it was um, in the early days. So, and this is um, a picture from the same period. And this is the, when it was the town library, it's called the Noyes Memorial Library. This was the reading room of the library. And this is what we now know as the Cunningham Gallery, the front gallery, as you come, as you come in the front door of the museum with the stained glass window that you, could, that you can see there. So that, um, and you can see the, the card catalog and the, the idea of, a, of an early library here. This room is one that you'll, um, most people never see. This is up on the top floor of the building. And um, it was part historical society display and part um, library, library room as well. So again, you can see more things from our collection, the fire buckets hanging um, from the ceiling, a great chandelier, um, a window that is no longer there in the end of the building. Um, chairs. We have lots of chairs in our collection and a lot of them came in early. So this, this is some of some of our early chairs. But now to show some of the changes. So in the top, you can see a small image of the original room that I showed first, and then two larger images of what happened to the room over time. So in, in the 19, early 1960s, 
um, the, the Historical Society was offered the Oliver Wolcott Jr. House on South Street. And we, um, we already had the Tapping Reef House open as a historic house museum, so we didn't, we didn't want, apparently, to open another historic house museum. And at the same time, the library was looking for larger space to move to. And so we sort of essentially did a trade with the library and they moved into the Oliver Wilkett Jr. House and became the Oliver Wilkett Jr. Library and put their addition on the back of that building. And we renovated this building into, um, into gallery space. So this is what we call the Liggett Gallery. Um, you can again see the, the um, chairs are still up in the balcony on the left-hand screen. And that exhibit is, um, that was an exhibit on Anson Dickinson miniatures that we did in the um, late 70s, early 80s. I'm not sure of the exact date. And the other screen is a quilt exhibit from some point in time. I'm not sure exactly when, but you can see that the room was completely cleared of collections and started to, and is starting to be used for interpretive exhibits, which was a new way of, of really thinking instead of just showing everything you had we're now showing exhibits that have a theme and a purpose. And then in um, 1989, we renovated the museum once again, and I'll talk a little bit more about that as we see other spaces. But now you can see the Liggett Gallery here as um, the exhibit that we have today. So again, it's, it's an interpretive exhibit. It talks about Litchfield history over time. It has, um, this gallery now has most of our Ralph Earl portraits. So you can see the portraits of Benjamin Talmadge and Mary Floyd Talmadge in the corner. And um, right now the exhibit talks about the different, in addition to the Earls and the and early Litchfield, it talks about the different areas of Litchfield, East Litchfield, Bantam, Mor not Morris, excuse me, Northfield and the, and the town of Litchfield. So we're trying to, trying to now talk about the entire community, which is um, not something that we, we did early on. So then we move to the Cunningham Gallery, which is again, the front gallery as you come in the front door of the museum, if you've been here. And it was also renovated in the um, 60s, early 70s to hold um, different exhibits. And when I was hired, it was called the Earl Gallery and all of the Ralph Earl paintings were in the gallery and then occasionally other things would um, come in, come in around them. And it was actually a great gallery to show the Earl portraits because the ceiling is kind of low and you could you could see them up close and up close and personal and that that's a great a great way to look at the exhibits but you also felt i think when you walked in there that there were 13 people staring at you and um and it wasn't really interpreted or an interpretive look at the look at the um at the portraits but it did allow us to show different parts of the collection in ways that we'd never been able to do before with at that point, modern lighting and a carpet. And the, the, the walls in these galleries were really fascinating um, at this point. They were made out of cloth covered board so that you could put nails or hanging up things to hang the paintings into the walls and it would never show a, show, a, um, show a mark. But the walls eventually got, the fabric got very dirty. So when we renovated again, we took the fabric off the walls and um, and used um, just wallboard walls. So this is that same gallery now. Um, we use it for we use it for different things. Um, you can see in the upper upper right, it's an exhibition gallery. This is an exhibit of Litchfield County Furniture, and um, we rarely now use the center floor of the gallery for exhibits. We did for this exhibit because it was a big important loan exhibit and we needed the space to be able to do that. But now if you look on the bottom, you can see that we generally use this gallery for exhibits that are on the wall and because we use the center of the room as a lecture and program room. So you might see somebody like Pete Vermilia here doing a lecture, um, I think on World War I, at least that's what the exhibit was um, during, the, during the time of the lecture. Um, we also use it for educational programming. So you can walk in the building and see um, you know, 43rd graders doing something intense and fun, or um, it may just be an open gallery depending on, on the time of day and when you're here, but we use it a lot. Um, we're really fortunate that we have um, on the back end of the gallery, chair storage, um, so we can just set up chairs easily and we have um, the ability to show slides and other programming here. So it's a really useful space. 
When we renovated in 1989, we added an addition to the building, which was at that point called the Litchfield History Gallery. And the top left-hand picture with the white figures and me, that's me in the denim skirt there, um, was that was the exhibit that we put in when we renovated the building. And it was intended to be a permanent exhibit. The, the figures represent students at the Litchfield Law School and the Litchfield Female Academy. And it, it was an attempt at doing history from Litchfield history, sort of from prehistory to the present day. And it, it worked well, but eventually it didn't work anymore. And we decided that um, we, there were other ways we could tell the story and that we could use the space differently. So let's see if I can move my, my face over here. So on, on the right hand side of the screen there, um, you can see an exhibit that was about um, commerce and business in Litchfield. And that is Herbie Brooks um, Potter's Wheel and some of Herbie Brooks pottery. So we took the, um, we took the permanent exhibit out and the area where the potter's wheel is shown is to the area right where the, the young woman in the white dress is. So we left the walls and base and um, platforms in that room and just worked around them and put our exhibits up using the existing walls. And then you can see in the bottom left hand corner, there's an exhibit on, on the Civil War and the, the, the wall on the left with the map on it is, is the same wall as the Herbie Brooks pottery. So that worked for a few years. And then eventually it became really clear that it constricted the way we could do exhibits so that we couldn't really use the space in the best possible way. So um, here in Litchfield, we're really fortunate. Those of you who don't know Litchfield, we have a local foundation called the Sertas Foundation. And the Sertas Foundation gave us funding to take out what had been permanent walls and completely redo the gallery. So we were able to put new carpet in, paint the walls, and buy the blue walls that you see in the bottom right-hand corner, which were only blue because we painted them blue, but they're, they're portable, changeable walls so that we can change the configuration and, um, and move the walls depending on um, what we need and what the exhibit calls for. And so that was an exhibit on the, on the Litchfield Female Academy that closed last year. Oops. Okay, so now I'm in the way again. I'll put me in the middle, how about that? So um, the top left-hand corner, that is um, in a, a space that is now, if you know the museum, it's our gift shop, which you can see in the space below it. So it started out um, in the early days, that was an exhibit um, on the upper left on the Litchfield Female Academy. You can see Female Academy Needleworks and um, the, the Student Globe and some chairs that belong to Tapping Reef on the, in the top left. On the right hand side, that's the next iteration of that space. Um, it was called the Brickley Gallery. We were given a, um, a donation by Richard Brickley in memory of his first wife. And so there's some paneling in there that was um, period paneling, but not from Litchfield and some other material. Um, there's a great portrait of Oliver Wolcott there um, from, you know, just from the collection. So it became an interpretive exhibit space again. And then down in the bottom, you can see that we took that space and um, turned it into the museum shop. So, and now we're back up to the room on the top floor that was the library reading room and part of the, part of the museum collections as well. You can see on the bottom left-hand slide, the top corner of that um, window arched window that you can see in the top slide and from some point in the early um, late 60s early 70s that room upstairs became our research library so you can see the, the shelves um, with the and the and the researchers desks on the bottom left on the bottom right those of you who have known the historical society for a long time may recognize Barbara Todd at her desk um, Barbara was the long time um, assistant here and and li librarian and just person who helped everybody do whatever whatever needed to be done and the old card catalog so it's a great it was a good space for the library when it was there the problem was that it was um, up two flights of stairs so that it wasn't accessible to anybody who had any kind of um, problem with stairs so it was a little bit um, it was a little bit awkward that way 
And because it was upstairs, at times when the library was open and the museum was closed, the only way people could get in was to ring the front doorbell and then wait for somebody to run downstairs and let them in. And that was off-putting to people. It just wasn't the ideal space for a library. And I'm in the wrong slide again. And at the same time, the downstairs room, which is now our library reading room, we'll take a look at that, was collection storage. So we had the collections that we didn't want accessible to people on the ground floor and the library that we did want accessible to people on the top floor. So this is what collection storage looked like when I arrived. Um, and my first reaction to this was, wow, what a great collection. My second reaction was, oh my God, what do I do with it? So um, you can see the fireplace here that's in the reading room um, and different parts of the collection. It's um, lots of um, things that we do know. This, we call him the creepy doll. Um, he's a sculpture from the, from the 70s. There's some band boxes up on top of the shelves, <clears throat> a painting on the floor, um, boxes with costumes in them, mannequins that we use to display the costumes. Um, things are moving into archival boxes and at least trying to be organized on the shelves, but there just wasn't enough room for the collection. It just wasn't possible to do it in an appropriate way. And then there were other spaces down here that spaces that are now things like our furnace room or the room where we um, where we do exhibit preparation, where collections were stored because there was literally no other place to put them. So there were, on the bottom right, there's some painting racks where paintings and prints were kept. Um, all the spinning wheel equipment was in a room that is actually now the furnace room. It was, the furnace was in a different place at this time. So really the collection, um, our collection is huge. It was somewhat organized by type of object and, but in other ways it was, um, it was complicated and it really wasn't accessible even to us because we didn't know what we had. And eventually we'll talk about how we figured out what we had, but that's a different, that's a different talk. So now we can go back and take a look at what we have now. So the top left hand slide is the library upstairs and collection storage downstairs. And then the other three slides are what is now the library reading room. So you can see in the top right hand slide that um, initially we had some exhibit space in the, in the reading room. So we had the Oliver Wilkett Jr. portrait and a, a desk that belonged to the Wilkett family. But as um, computers became more and more important in research and in the way people use our spaces, we moved into um, that space being computer desks so that when visitors come, researchers come, there's a place where they can plug in a computer or when we have interns or other staff working, there's a place where they can work. And then we also use this room for programming. And you can see on the, um, on the bottom right that Linda is running, Linda Archivist is running a program in the reading room. So then there's the library. What do we do with the library? So I showed you the gallery upstairs that was the addition, the Litchfield History Gallery, that was the addition to the building. And fortunately, when we put the addition on upstairs, we were able to have a ground floor room as well. So all of the library moved downstairs. And this is um, this, the stacks, the library stacks, which are closed to the public. This is what they looked like over the course of probably the first 10 or so years after we renovated the building. So you can see that in the upper right hand corner, there was a lot of open space. Um, there's the card catalog and there's some shelving behind. But you can also see from the archive boxes and the other material on the floor that we just didn't, again, we still didn't have enough space to, to store everything that we had and to, and to make it accessible to researchers and to us for our research. So on the bottom right, we took some of the um, some of the space on the left and put in more um, compact shelving. We did have compact shelving on the right from the beginning. So some of the collection was on compact shelving. Some of it was in boxes on the floor, as you can see. So the first step was to put more compact shelving in, which really eased the burden in the room greatly but it didn't stop us from filling the space very quickly. So last year, again, with the help of the Sertos Foundation, we were able to buy more compact shelving. 
and put, or this is two or three years ago actually now, put more compact shelving on the left-hand side so that we had um, probably four ranges of shelving with, um, with empty shelves that we could expand into, which we have done. So um, again, in a very short time, we're gonna be facing another crunch um, about with library and archives space. It's just, we're, we're continuing to collect. Um, people in town are incredibly generous about giving us records and family business records, um, records from different organizations in town uh, and family, family records. And so that collection keeps growing and the space sadly does not, but it is one of those things that we're constantly working on. And then back to the regular collection, the museum collection. So in the upper left-hand corner, you can again see the, um, the room upstairs that became the library. And then when we move the library downstairs, we move the collection upstairs. So um, we were able to put in shelving to hold, um, hold the collection and we had it as organized as we could make it within the space that we had. Um, but again, the collection continued to grow and it continued to grow in a couple of ways. One way is that people gave us more and more objects so that we um, were accessioning things into the collection. But if you look, look at the bottom right left hand picture with the stack of boxes, those are all costume boxes. We have an amazing collection of historic, historic dresses, um, women's clothing, men's clothing, children's clothing, and other textiles. And um, when we moved everything up into this room, they were they were quite literally stuffed into into smaller boxes so that there might be between seven and ten dresses in one small box and as we started to um, look at them and catalog them and and find out more about them we rehoused them so that they had more room to breathe and they were properly stored so instead of having five or six or seven dresses in a box, we might have one or two dresses in a box, which meant a whole bunch more boxes. And so the boxes were on, starting to live on the floor. And other things were starting to live on the floor just because we were running, we were desperately running out of space. So again, thank you to the Sertas Foundation and um, a bequest from Pamela Cunningham Copeland, who grew up in Litchfield. We were able to build um, our curatorial center behind the Tapping Reef House. So this building is a dedicated collection storage building, which houses almost everything that you saw in the last picture um, and more. So you can see um, it has three floors. The ground floor has furniture. I told you we had a lot of chairs. The ground floor has furniture stored in compact shelving. It's neat, it's accessible, we know what's there. It's all in our online database. Um, the ground, the top, the, so that's the ground floor. The middle floor, it has a workspace and painting racks so that we can store paintings off the floor and um, hanging so that they're easily accessible. We can see what they are and they're stored safely. And then the top floor has um, racks of shelving. This is not, um, it's not compact shelving, it's open shelving, but we're able to take things out of boxes, put them on the shelves and really see what the collection is. And Believe it or not, in the best of all possible worlds, everything on those shelves is in our database in one way or another. It's at the very least inventory. So if somebody says, do you have a pewter coffee pot? We can find the pewter coffee pot and um, or the clock or whatever else there is in that collection. So the collection is now housed safely in a climate controlled building that is very secure. And you're seeing something here that most people don't get to see because it is a building that is not open to the public. So meanwhile, we had all those costume boxes and we did not move the textile collection down to the curatorial center. We decided that we would maintain the top space where the collection had been stored, the top in the, the left-hand picture there as um, space that is dedicated to textiles, costumes and textiles and related um, accessories. And, but we also knew that we needed more shelving to be able to do that. So the pictures on the right are um, pictures of everything that had been in that room moved out of the room and in, into the Cunningham Gallery. Well, we put in new shelving upstairs. And the new shelving upstairs is, again, it's compact shelving and it is dedicated to, um, to costumes and textiles. There's space for rolled textiles in the top right hand um, photograph. 
the boxes have room to breathe. There's, they're all labeled, they're all, they're all identified. And we were able to do this project through a grant from the National Endowment for the Humanities. Um, so we were very lucky to be able to um, put this collection into, into really good storage now. And this is a collection that researchers use often. Um, I don't know if, you, if you're part of our family, you may have um, watched um, Wednesdays with Carol over the course of, of last year where she um, talked about Carol as a, a board member and a volunteer who's a costume expert. And she um, talked about things that she was finding in the collection as she cataloged the collection. And those I believe are available somewhere online, Sean can tell you when we're done, if you're still, if you'd like to see them, but they're wonderful um, descriptions of really interesting things in our collection. So that's where we are right now. So we have the Litchfield History Museum in the top corner with the new galleries and the new collection storage that you've seen. The um, collection storage facility in the bottom right, um, which is a, a life-saving building in terms, in terms of our collection. <laughs> And the Tapping Reef House and the Litchfield Law School, which are not the subject of this talk, but will be the subject of another talk soon. And that's my story. So if you have any questions, um, I think Sean may have them and I'll try and answer them. Thank you, Kathy. Um, just a, a couple of, there are some shout outs. People are always very interested in seeing Liggett, um, those early photos of Liggett Gallery. They great. Um, really show a different view of a, of a space. Um, so I'm going to give people a couple of moments if they'd like to um, ask any questions. Um, also, yes, the Wednesdays with Carol is available. It should be on our website. And it's also, if you go on our Facebook page, that's where we had posted all the posts originally. Um, just, just to give people a couple more moments. And then also to share one other thing on our website, um, the Litchfield Historical Site has, uh, we've been trying to document the coronavirus response in Litchfield. So if you do have time um, or some thoughts you'd like to share with us, definitely go to our website, litchfieldhistoricalsociety.org, and you'll see it right there on the main page. Um, share your thoughts with us. We're excited to hear, um, you know, how you've been, uh, how your life has had to change for this. And it doesn't look like we have any questions yet. Um, That's okay. <laughs> Everyone's saying thank you. Um, always very interested to see those. Oh, um, it looks like we do have a question. Uh, we're going to do a little bit of a segue, it looks like, with it. Um, but what year did the Tapping Reeve House and Law School uh, become what, what we see in these photos now as part of the museum? So we, um, it's another story, but it's a good one. Um, we acquired the law school first, and um, I believe in 1914, um, might be 1916, I'd have to check. That building, um, it had been next to the Tapping Reef House when the law school was open, but um, after the law school closed, it moved around town and was in a number of different places um, and was given back to the Historical Society, as I said, in 1914. And it was placed next to the, um, on, to the right hand side of the photographs that's there between us and the little, what's an antique store now. Um, and then, um, so that was there for a number of years. And then in, in the 19, um, 1929, we bought the Tapping Reef House from Yale. Um, it had been left to Yale from the last um, person who lived there who was named Woodruff. Yale didn't want it, so we purchased it from Yale right before the stock market crash. And then um, um, renovated it um, and opened it as a historic house museum in the 1930s and 1933, I think. So it remained a historic house museum until 1998, 99 when we um, renovated it, put an addition on it, and um, put an interpretive exhibit um, about the law school into the house. So um, if you know the story of the law school, it was started by Tapping Reeve in 1774. There were over a thousand graduates who did all sorts of amazing things in this country, including 10% of the United States Congress in 1800. So the exhibit really celebrates the school, the students, who they were, what they learned in Litchfield, what Litchfield was like when they were here and then what they did when they left. So if you haven't been there when we open, please visit. We're also hoping to be able to do a virtual tour of the interior of the museum, um, the Tapping Reef Museum, as part of our work during this time period. Thank you, Kathy. Uh, we have another question and it's, uh, the collections building looks like a historic barn, but tell us about its structural and systems to protect the objects today. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> 
So it does look like a historic barn because we designed it to look like um, to look like a historic barn. There was a, a building on that on that footprint that was um, sort of partly a 20th century garage, partly a falling down barn. It was a not a not a useful structure in any way, um, and was in pretty desperate shape. So we um, we took that down and we designed this building specifically for the collection. So it. Um, it has three floors. It has the compact shelving on, on two of the floors. It's climate controlled by zone. So each floor is controlled separately so that we can keep a different climate if we need to in the different, in the different parts of the barn. Um, it has running water, but no other um, facilities in it. So it's, it's really meant to, to, house, um, to house the collection safely and give the curators room to work um, to really study the collection when they need to. Um, the barn doors are one of the ways to access the building. There's a, a big locked metal door behind the barn doors. And so when we're moving things in and out of the building, we can do it pretty safely, pretty safely and easily. And I should note that in the last two years, um, we've done a major project behind the barn um, which is called the Tapping Reed Meadow. And it's um, our property runs from South Street to Meadow Street and uh, the, the meadow now includes uh, an apple orchard, what we hope will be a chestnut grove, stone walls, a, a children's garden, a pavilion, and it's open now if people want to get out and walk. It's a great place to walk and a great place to spend some time outside. Great. Thank you, Kathy. Um, it looks like that's it for our, oh wait, never mind. <laughs> One more question. Uh, All right. Looks like it's the Getchies. Uh, are the plantings around the Tapping Reap House and Complex historically accurate? Sort of. Um, when the building was open, no, so let's see, when was this? In the 1970s, um, as a bicentennial project, um, the law school was um, placed on the site where it is now. It had been in further back on the property before that. Really, the, the law school is a good story, and I will do it in a couple of weeks. Um, and at that time, the Historical Society hired a landscape architect, a very well-known landscape architect, whose name was Rudy Favretti. And he designed the gardens around the house to be, um, to reflect historic gardens. Um, that was in 1976. And um, things just die and move and change. Gardens are never very static. So. So although some of those original plantings are still there and some of the features of that garden are still there, it, um, it has changed over the years. In doing the research in the last couple of years to um, work on the garden in the meadow behind the Tapping Reef House, we found the original plans from 1976. And so one of our long-term garden goals is to recreate that, or that Rudy Favretti 1976 historic garden around the house, but not this year but it will come. Great, thank you. It's always interesting to see how, uh, how the buildings themselves are moving around like a dance. Yeah, they do. The law school particularly has, he, it's been, um, he's been, she's been, it's been, it, it's a house. <laughs> it's been everywhere in town and had lots of, lots of, it was a dress shop. It was a, someone's office attached to a house on West Street. Um, lots of, lots of different things but now it's home. All right, well, it looks like we're just getting a lot of uh, thank yous from our uh, attendees. Uh, everyone's saying that they learned a lot today, um, but it doesn't look like we're gonna have any more questions. So, Kathy, okay. thank you. Thank you, Sean, for helping me through this. This is technology <laughs> I'm not familiar with, but now I am, and um, this was fun. And thank you all for joining, and I hope that you'll continue to join us for Coffee with the Curators and the other online events that we're, that we're offering. Take care.